Good morning, everyone. And for those who are Irish, and for those who are not, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Speaking of Irish, one of the earlier and very successful examples of alternative finance is actually the Irish Loan Fund, inspired by the writer Jonathan Swift in the 1700s to provide small loans, often less than three pounds each, with no interest to the poor in Dublin and in the surrounding rural areas. Jonathan's belief was very simple. Being poor and having no credit history doesn't mean you are not credit worthy. And his idea caught on. By 1843, there were more than 300 different Irish loan funds having lent hundreds and thousands of small loans to at one time 20% of the entire Irish population. In 1885, the construction for the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty ran into financial difficulties. There was no money left to finish it off. Another writer and renowned publisher, Joseph Pulitzer, leveraged the social media of his day, the newspaper, to governize the people of New York and to fundraise. In less than five months' time, over 100,000 US dollars was raised from 160,000 individual donors, with the average donation of just 63 US cents. And the pedestal was built. And if we travel further into history and visit the Pacific island of Yap, you will discover the wonders and the marvels of Ren. Ren are those large circular limestone discs can weigh as heavy as your car. But they have been used by the local people as a currency for centuries. Those money stones are so heavy and buying and selling an item using one of those discs involves an agreeing to the transfer of ownership and the record of a transaction into the entire oral history of that community. And because the island community is sufficiently small and everyone knows each other and they trust each other with their collective history of monetary transactions based on those discs. Doesn't matter if the stone is high up on the hill or buried at the bottom of the ocean. If you think about it, the story of the Irish Loan Fund is a tale of the earlier version of a peer-to-peer -peer lending. The fundraising campaign masterminded by Joseph Pulitzer is an account of a textbook civic crowdfunding campaign. And the chronicle of the island of Yap and is the stone money currency system based on shared knowledge, shared history, and mutual trust is the harbinger for today's blockchain-based digital currency. And in many ways, in today's online alternative finance, which is defined as channels or instruments have emerged outside of the traditional banking and capital market systems, is a return to these earlier historical roots. When finance was simpler, more social and transparent, and perhaps kinder and gentler. What is different, however, is that those online finance we are seeing today is technology and enabled, digitally transforming and global in scale. It needs to be understood in the broader context of a digital transformation, the reshaping of the new channels, the abandonment of the old, and the emergence of new intermediaries and new platforms. Looking around the lecture theater today, many of you could be fittingly described as digital natives. You know those people who were born with mobile phone firmly attached to their hands. 
and before they can speak, they text. Those kind of people. Think about how you buying books these days, or purchase a flight, consume music, watch a movie, order a cab in London, or socialize, interact with your friends. Things have definitely changed. For sure, the old channel is still there, but you are increasingly gravitating towards the new, and you are almost conditioned to do things through the new channels, the new intermediaries, and new platforms. Often without giving a second thought. The similar kind of a digital transformation also happened in finance, driven by the similar factors, such as the advancement in technology, the gradual shift in culture, and the increasing adoption of e-commerce. But it was also founded upon the debris and ashes of the 2008 financial crisis, and it was. Ushered in, almost with a sense of the fierce urgency of now. People were looking for new channels of finance because the old, highly centralized system hasn't worked. It was inefficient and it was dangerous because it gives free rein to institutionalize the capital, flowing round recklessly, highly leveraged within the banking sectors, within the capital market systems. Hopping from one sector to another, floating from one country to another, always seek for the highest return, regardless what is the cost. If you are depositing your money in your local branches, in Manchester, in Newcastle, in Cambridge, that money rarely gets to stay within the local economy, or being utilised by the productive sector of the economy, such as manufacturing. And it was mainly used for investment, for speculation, for making more money, or buying into the U.S. subprime mortgages. How that decision turned out, and because the financial system was highly concentrated, the contagion of a crisis was spread much more effectively. During the financial crisis, the credit to small and medium enterprises was drying out. Because in Britain, the five largest banks controls over 91% of all SME lending, and the same thing happened to venture capital. All the equity investment was drying out too, over two thirds of them. So entrepreneurs were struggling to get anything financed. So it was in that darkest hour, we began to see the green offshoots of financial innovation. And the development of online alternative channels for capital formation and allocation, for lending, for payments, for credit risk modelings, and for market prevention. For example, in reward-based crowdfunding, it allows musicians, artists, painters, writers, actors, and game makers to connect directly with their fan base. And fundraise through online platforms, and people are willing to support and donate because they can feel the passion of those creators. They want to participate in the creative process. Sure, they get perks or rewards, but they also feel an immense sense of pride when the project got funded. Equity-based crowdfunding is another channel. It ensures the access to earlier stage investment. Is no longer the rights and privilege of the few, of the rich. And in the UK, for as little as ten pounds, you can start investing in ventures such as renewable energy and high-tech consumer products. You name it. Sure, it is a high risk and high return activities, but for the first time, for many investors, you get to choose which sector you want to invest in, and which venture and which entrepreneur you want to back. And that is incredibly liberating and empowering. UK is also the birthplace of the peer-to-peer -peer lending. Those platforms matches borrowers and lenders directly, disintermediating the banks, and providing vital loans and finance and credit to consumers and to small media enterprises. And those platforms can do things much more effectively because they are using new forms of data. 
from behavioral data to social metric data, biometric data, psychometric data, to GIS-based data, even your social media data. So a borrowers can get their loan proved within hours, if not minutes, and there's no penalty for early repayment. And as digital natives, you may be surprised to find out that over a third of the lenders on the UK peer-to-peer -peer business lending platforms are over the age of 55. And I had the privilege of interviewing an 83-year-old pensioner who told me very proudly, he said, I have an active lending portfolio of 2,000 pounds spread over 100 loans. And he was a factory worker. And he was happy to support manufacturing sectors in the north. And he was satisfied with moderate income he generated each month and each quarter. And of course, in the post-crisis economy, government policies and regulation also helped. From the British Business Bank, which has invested taxpayers' money directly through peer-to-peer -peer lending platform to help SMEs, to the Treasury, which has just launched Innovative Finance ISIS, and to the British Financial Conduct Authority, and equipped with quite a unique competition mandate, it devised a quite proportionate and bespoke two-tiered regulatory regime to help alternative finance grow and scale. So crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending are entering into the mainstream, but are also developing rapidly, not only in UK or Europe, but across the Americas, in the Asia Pacific region, in Africa, and in the Middle East. And throughout research, we collected market data from alternative finance from 182 countries. And in 2016 alone, over $300 billion worth of finance were raised from those new innovative channels. In the UK, nowadays, over 70% of all seed and venture stage investment are being channeled through equity-based crowdfunding. And of course, there are alternative channels for payments as well. Different forms of the mobile payments have helped many developing countries and economies to digitally live for by providing accessible, low-cost, convenient, more agile payment solutions to millions of people who were underbanked and unbanked. In Kenya, one of its most predominant mobile payment providers are now channeling over 50% of Kenya's GDP every single year through its platforms. Then there is a worldwide phenomenon of cryptocurrencies. Those are encrypted digital currencies flowing through peer-to-peer -peer networks with no requirement for a central authority. The first of its kind, you probably know, was invented in 2008 at the height of the financial crisis. And by this morning, when I looked, there are over 1,563 different cryptocurrencies. Thanks to the proliferation of ICOs, or initial coin offerings. Which raised the question, do we really need all 1,563 different cryptocurrencies? Are they being used for transactions to purchase goods and services as they mean to be? or they just have been used as new channels and new tools for speculation to make more money, exactly like the old paradigm. And that's when an alarm should be sounded, because those new channels and instruments, amazing as they may be, they're not guaranteed to be disruptive to the incumbents, nor they are progressive in its essence. By its every nature of being open and digital, those channels can be easily utilized, flooded, or even controlled by actors and agents of old traditional finance. And indeed, from their perspective, those are just new channels of making the capital accumulation and distribution process cheaper, faster, more efficiently, not fair, or more just. Indeed, you're saying institutional investors from banks to mutual funds to hedge funds are pouring billions into online alternative finance market. 
launch their own peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms or buying the existing ones. Therefore, to avoid making the same mistakes that got us into the calamities of 2008, and indeed through many crises of capitalism throughout our history, we really need to think beyond the channels. I think who governs those channels? What purpose do they serve? What is flowing inside the channel? Does it always have to be money? Or could be something of value? Could be virtue? Could be charity? Could they be for goodness? Or could be time? If anything, that the ancient histories of the Irish loan funds, or just for Pulitzer, or the island people of Yap and their stone money, tells us is the money is not always financial or even transactional. It is always politically, culturally, socially, and morally conditioned and constructed. Therefore, we need to think about how we can fundamentally change the infrastructure of money. We should never take money and accept money as it is, but imagine what it could be. How can we devise new channels that really serve the interest and increase the welfare of millions of people who are financially disfranchised or marginalized? How can we leverage new instruments such as the blockchain to rewire our digital infrastructure and rethink how data, information, network, assets, even governance or democracy could be reorganized for better? So, in the digital world, with so many different channels, old and new, borrowing the words of Robert F. Kennedy, you as individuals, through your thinking and your action and your deeds, can become a powerful ripple of hope, crossing each other from a million centers of energy and daring. And these ripples can form a current through the channels can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So on this St. Patrick's Day, enjoy a pint of Guinness, but go forth to become that ripple of hope. Thank you.